Edward Nagel Ned Williamson was born October 24, 1857, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Williamson would begin his major league career with the Indianapolis Blues of the National League on May 1, 1878. In his rookie season, he would go on to play all 63 games as the starting third baseman for the Blues, compiling a .232 batting average, one home run, and scoring 31 runs. He would log his only game as an umpire on August 12th of that season in a game featuring the Providence Grays and Chicago White Stockings. After the Blues folded following the 1878 season, Williamson would join the Chicago White Stockings the following year. He would become the starting third baseman for the team and put together an impressive defensive season, leading the league in fielding percentage at the position with 871, as well as topping the league in assists, putouts, and double plays. Williamson's offense would also see an improvement, with a 294 average while hitting 20 doubles and 13 triples with an OPS plus of 149. Over the next three seasons, his offensive statistics would fluctuate as he would hit 251 in 1880, 268 in 1881, and 282 in 1882. Williamson's power numbers would also become inconsistent as he hit 20, 12, and 27 doubles over those three seasons while seeing his OPS Plus not reach the same heights as it did in 1879. His defense would stay consistently great over this period as he would lead the league in fielding percentage from 1880 through 1882, as well as assists in 1881 and 1882. During the spring of 1881, Nettie L. Tucker of Salem, Virginia, and her mother spent a long vacation in New Orleans where the White Stockings happened to be training. Nettie's mother wasn't fond of ball players, but Silver Flint's wife mingled with Nettie in the hotel lobby and snuck Nettie off to see a baseball game. During an exciting moment, Williamson came to bat with runners on base, and Nettie reportedly told Mrs. Flint, If he brings those men in, I'll throw him these flowers. Sure enough, Williamson crushed a home run, and Nettie tossed him a bouquet of flowers, to which Ed responded by doffing his cap. Nettie was immediately embarrassed, but that was all it took for Cupid to strike them both. Back at the hotel, Nettie's mother remained cool to the ball player interested in her daughter. Then, still just 16, he was 23. However, over time she came to accept Williamson for what he was, good-natured, charming, and in love with Nettie. The following summer of 1881, Williamson quietly married Nettie during a trip to St. Louis. Nettie loved baseball, attended a number of games, and frequently traveled with Williamson on road trips. 1883 would prove to be a big year for Williamson's bat, as he would set a major league record and career best with 49 doubles. This record would stand until Canadian Tip O'Neill would break it with 52 in 1887. The dimensions of Chicago's Lakeshore Park were the cause of Williamson's power surge as the distance in left field was 186 feet, 300 feet to center, and 190 feet to right field. In 1884, anything hit over the fence was considered a double. After 1884, they were considered a home run. At this stage of baseball, the home team controlled the ground rules for their respective stadiums. This would prove advantageous for Williamson as he would become the single season home run king in 1884 by hitting 27 home runs in the 112 game season, surpassing the record set the previous year by Harry Stovey when he hit 14 home runs. 25 of Williamson's 27 home runs that year were hit at home. The record would stand for 35 years until George Herman Babe Ruth would beat it in 1919 while playing with the Boston Red Sox and hitting 29 home runs in 130 games. That same season, Williamson would become the first player to hit three home runs in one game in the second game of a doubleheader against the Detroit Wolverines on May 30th. During his power surge, Williamson would drive in 84 runs, earning an OPS plus of 170, and maintained his high caliber defense by leading the league in assists and double plays in 1883 and 1884. Following the 1884 season, the White Stockings would move to West Side Park and subsequently Williamson would see his power numbers drop significantly, hitting three home runs in 1885. His doubles followed suit with 16 and his average also fell to 238. Despite the power outage and struggles at the plate, Williamson would once again lead all third basemen in assists, double plays, and for the fifth and final time, fielding percentage with 892. 
Williamson's defense would help lead Chicago to the National League Championship, facing the St. Louis Browns in a seven-game World Series. Prior to the start of Game 1, each team participated in a field day consisting of contests of skill with Williamson winning the long throw with a toss that traveled 400 feet and 4 inches, earning him $100 and a diamond locket. When asked about winning the contest, Williamson said he sent a telegraph to his wife Nettie, adding, The little woman will be prouder than I am of my victory. Disappointingly, the 1885 World Series ended with each team winning three games and the deciding game ending in a tie. Williamson would go only 2 for 23 with two base hits and scoring only one run. Williamson would switch positions in 1886 to shortstop, again helping the White Stockings win the National League Championship, their fifth in seven years. Williamson would again see his offensive numbers drop with a 216 average over 430 at bats with six home runs and an OPS plus of 95. The White Stockings would face the St. Louis Browns once again, with the Browns winning four games to two, and Williamson would continue his struggles at the plate with only one hit in 18 at-bats. Williamson would again spend the season at shortstop in 1887 and would see his offensive numbers have a modest increase with a 267 average, 20 doubles, 14 triples, 9 home runs, an OPS plus of 114, and another stellar season at shortstop with a fielding percentage of 890. In 1888, Williamson would play 132 games, batting 250 with 73 RBIs, an OPS plus of 128, while leading the league in assists and double plays, and achieving a fielding percentage of 884. Albert Spaulding, following the completion of the 1888 baseball season, would promote baseball in an around-the-world tour featuring the Chicago White Stockings and a team consisting of players from other National League teams. Departing on October 20th, 1888, the teams would play exhibition games throughout the western U.S. for the first month. They would then arrive in Hawaii while visiting many foreign countries including England, France, Italy, Egypt, Australia, and Sri Lanka. Williamson was the correspondent for the Cincinnati Enquirer and sent letters that would be published as the tour progressed. In the March 2, 1889 edition, Williamson wrote, The many banquets we had enjoyed during our 24 days stay in Australia, 28 banquets and receptions, hardly fitted us for a sea voyage, and oh lord, how sick we were. Only a few of our entire party, 35, escaped. For a few days, no one cared to hear the word dining room mentioned, and whenever the gong announcing the meals was heard, Several of the boys were seen to move toward the side of the vessel, they would lean over the rail, and, well, just imagine the rest. During the voyage, one of the Hindus on board died of consumption. Williamson went on to say that one of the officers called me and took me below. I was just in time to see the body dropped overboard. A feeling of sadness came over me in which I could not rid myself of for several days. I was indeed thankful for the good health I was enjoying. I suppose it matters very little where one lies after death, but the mere thought of being buried at sea caused one to shudder. In the March 11, 1889 edition, Williamson wrote, On the night of January 26th, a few hours before leaving Colombo, we entered the waters of the Arabian Sea at the same time bidding farewell to the Indian Ocean. The following morning about 6 o'clock I was suddenly aroused by the cry of PIRATES! followed almost instantly by the double report of a cannon. I did not wait to dress, but immediately ran out into the saloon. There a sight met my gaze that I will never forget. Those of our party who were not too badly frightened were scattered around the saloon, dressed only in their night garments. On each countenance was an indescribable look of fear. In the midst of it all was big, fat Lee Lynch, a counterpart of Willie Mustayer and the tourists. He stood there wringing his hands frantically, and in a most piteous tone exclaimed, We're gone. They've captured the ship. Our little mascot ran up to Lynch, and in terrified tones cried, For God's sake, boss, save me! The poor little fellow actually tried to crawl under Lynch's nightshirt. The scene was so ludicrous that Lynch could hold in no longer. He flung himself on the sofa and laughed till he cried. We afterward learned that the night previous, Captain Tholenhurst requested Lynch to inform our party at daybreak the following morning he intended firing a salute in honor of Emperor William's birthday. The only person Lynch told was Jim Fogarty. 
Together they arranged a plan by which they succeeded in giving a few of our party a fright that they will remember of some time to come. Williamson would go on to say that, We entered the Red Sea just at sunrise. What a magnificent sight, as we stood in awe at the stern of our steamer and gazed admiringly at the sun in all its brilliancy as it gradually rose from behind the rocks that line the shore of Arabia at the entrance to this historical sea. I think it requires such a sea voyage for one to fully appreciate the magnificence of the heavens. At home I seldom saw the sunrise when I felt in an admiring mood. I paid but little attention to sunsets. I would look upon one and probably say yes, very pretty, and carelessly turn away. Now I anxiously await the hour of sunset. Each evening a new picture is formed, more beautiful than the one previous. During the tour, in a game in France on March 8, 1889, Williamson would suffer a devastating knee injury, tearing his kneecap. He would be forced to recover in England, missing the remainder of the tour through Britain. In the early days of baseball, it was typical that the player be responsible for the cost of their own medical care, and Spalding refused to assist with Williamson's mounting expenses. Williamson never forgave Spalding. The injury caused Williamson's career to suffer, as he played in 47 games during the 1889 season. He batted 237, and of his 41 hits that season, only five of them were extra base hits. In his final Major League season, he joined the Chicago Pirates of the Players League in 1890, playing in 73 games and hitting only 195. Williamson traveled to Hot Springs, Arkansas in the spring of 1894 in hopes that he could recover from a liver ailment and lose weight as well. Unfortunately, these treatments did not work, and Williamson would die on March 3, 1894, at the age of 36 in Willow Springs, Arkansas, of dropsy complicated by consumption. He was buried in an unmarked grave at Rose Hill Cemetery in Chicago. On November 6, 2021, thanks to the efforts by the Society for American Baseball Research, SABRE, Williamson received a dedication and grave marker which notes his single season record of home runs set in 1884. Ed Williamson was described by many of his contemporaries as the best ball player they had ever seen. He was a fan favorite and a stalwart defender. He was as skilled in storytelling as he was stingy with his defense. Williamson's single season record of 27 home runs stood for 35 years, and it took the greatest slugger the game has ever seen to beat it. Ed Williamson's achievements on the field should be celebrated and honored, but most importantly Ed Williamson the man, much like a sunset that we seldom pay attention to, should be remembered and admired.